Next up, we have Dr. Lee Kuo An, a radiation oncologist who has more than 15 years of experience in the field. He currently practices at Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital and specializes in the treatment of cancers with radiotherapy. As Dr. Chow mentioned in the opening welcome, Dr. Lee will be sharing about proton therapy, accelerating into the future with radiotherapy. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Lee Kuo An. I'm a radiation oncologist at the Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital. Today, I'd like to talk about proton therapy. You might have heard about this or you might not. So this will be a simple introductory talk. Proton therapy is coming to Singapore, so what is it? Today, we will cover uh, what proton therapy is, uh, what are the benefits, where we might use it, how it's done, and some caveats. So what is proton therapy? Is it like a proton pack at the Ghostbusters? Uh, it's actually a type of radiotherapy. And uh, where it has certain uh, physical benefits compared to normal X-ray-based radiotherapy, and we will talk about that now. So X-ray-based radiotherapy is about 100 years old and has come a long way with many improvements over the years in how we can better deliver the radiation to the tumour uh, by shaping the beam better using IMRT and looking at the tumour so that we can deliver the radiation to the right spot using CT scans and we can then increase the dose to the tumour using stereotactic body radiotherapy. But the pace of improvements in radiotherapy have been slowing and we might be starting to approach a plateau. So what can we do to improve uh, better radiation delivery again? And proton therapy might be one of those ways. The difference between X-rays and proton therapy is shown on this slide. First, look at the graph in orange. That's the dose profile of normal X-rays as it enters the body. The strongest X-ray dose is at the entrance, and as it passes through the body, it loses energy. And by the time it gets to the tumour at depth, it's already lost about a third or half of its energy. In addition, you notice that the X-ray continues beyond the tumour, causing radiation injury on the exit side of the tumour as well. Contrast that to the graph in green, which is the profile of a proton. As it enters the body, only a small amount of radiation is deposited. It then deposits all of its energy within the tumour and on the other side, nothing comes out. And so the benefit is that you have reduced radiation exposure to the normal tissues both on the way in and on the way out. It is a bit like playing golf. So if you have a particle hit at the correct direction, at the right speed, considering the distance between the source and the target, as well as what it's passing through, you can again then get the proton to land in the correct spot. How do you accelerate the proton? This is through a cyclotron. And here's an animation. The proton is separated from the hydrogen atom. And then the protons are accelerated round and round, gaining speed with each round until they exit the machine and it's then directed at the patient. This is not unlike a slingshot. The proton is then directed through from the cyclotron room into the gantry where it uh, treats the patient. Within the patient, the proton is directed using pencil beams to treat the tumour spot by spot and layer by layer until it forms a 3D shape of the tumour. This is analogous to how a 3D printer works. What's the difference between proton therapy and the X-rays in the patient? Concentrate on the image on the left. That's a picture of radiation dose using IMRT in a prostate cancer case. In the picture on the right, that's a picture of the radiation dose delivered by proton therapy. If you look at the tumour dose in red, you will notice that the high dose conforms well in both cases to the shape of the tumour. But then look at the colour green and blues. 
That's the low dose and intermediate dose of X-rays versus protons. In the case of X-rays, there's a lot of low dose in the rest of the body, where it says in proton therapy, there is very little dose in the rest of the body. And why is proton therapy becoming more common now? It's technological improvements, reductions in the size, and the cost of proton therapy has increased its availability. Who benefits from uh, proton therapy? Proton therapy would benefit patients who have large and deep tumours where normal X-rays would expose a lot of normal tissue. Also, young patients, uh, patients who have a long lifetime of, uh, ahead of them, are susceptible to developing late delayed side effects of radiation, such as second malignancies. And so proton therapy might benefit young patients more. Also, if the tumour is situated in a sensitive organ, such as the liver, proton therapy might be able to deliver the necessary dose of radiation into the liver and yet spare enough normal tissue for adequate function. It's also useful in patients who have tumours that need higher doses than normal, like radio-resistant tumours, chordomas and chondrosarcomas, for instance. And also for patients with need for re-irradiation or previous radiation so that we can avoid further damage to normal tissues. So here are some example sites. In pediatrics, it's useful in uh, brain tumours, uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, uh, tumours in the brain such as craniopharyngiomas, lymphomas, and Wilms tumour. So take, for instance, the picture on the left. That's an example of radiotherapy for medulloblastoma where we have to treat the entire cranial spinal axis from the brain down to the spine. On figure A, that's an example of uh, X-ray-based cranial spinal radiation where you notice that in greens and blue doses, which are again the low and intermediate doses, there's exposure in the heart, lungs and reproductive organs. Whereas in figure B, the proton therapy is a bit able to avoid radiation of these other normal organs. And several studies have already shown the various benefits of protons in children, uh, having less effect on the IQ, less effect on hormones, and also reduce radiation-induced malignancies down the road. In adults, proton therapy can be used in the CNS. For instance, uh, in chordomas and chondrosarcomas of the base of skull, high doses are needed, uh, and yet we need to spare sensitive organs such as the brain stem. It is also useful in gliomas uh, of low grade, where patients are expected to live many years, and we want to prevent radiation from causing cognitive side effects down the road. In head and neck cancers, Proton therapy has already been shown to reduce acute and late side effects such as dry mouth, feeding tube, and hospitalizations, as well as late side effects of dry mouth and hence uh, poor dentition. Going down to the chest, proton therapy is useful for esophageal cancer where we are treating the esophagus and yet needing to spare the heart and lungs. So studies have shown that uh, proton therapy can reduce both toxicity as well as post-operative complication rate. In the liver, uh, X-rays have traditionally not been used very much for liver cancers because the liver is a sensitive organ. With proton therapy, we will now be able to deliver high enough doses and yet spare enough normal liver function. So this is an example of a trial which showed that with proton therapy, the worsening of the child's PU score was reduced in proton therapy compared to X-ray-based radiation. Again, the location of the tumour makes a difference. Proton therapy would be biggest benefit in deep tumours and large tumours. This is an example of a trial uh, not randomised of uh, proton therapy used in HCC. Uh, look at the bottom of the graph. You can see that local control is very high in the 90-95% range with very good survival. And you can then compare that to the 
traditional treatment using surgery and local ablative therapies, which also have similar uh, local control and survival rates. Here's an example of radiotherapy, or proton therapy, I should say, used in breast cancer radiotherapy. So sometimes it's hard to deliver the radiation without exposing too much heart and lungs. Because proton therapy is able to shape the beam better and stop, we are able to spare more heart and lung in difficult situations. In uh, prostate cancer, especially if we are planning to treat the entire lymph node chain, proton therapy should be able to reduce the exposure of the bone marrow, the rectum, the bladder, and the intestines. Here's an interesting case that I saw. Uh, this was a case of proton therapy used in anal cancer. And this patient who had a, a renal transplant for renal failure, and we needed to treat the lymph nodes without damaging the one and only kidney he had. So what is the evidence for proton therapy? Currently, there's not very much evidence in terms of randomized trials, but they are in progress from head to toe. And here are some examples. But until the results come out, do we really need to wait for randomized evidence before we are able to offer proton therapy? I would argue that's not always the case. When we went from 3D radiotherapy to IMRT, there were no randomized trials, and yet IMRT was embraced in a big way around the world because of the obvious benefits on dosimetric studies seen on the computer screen in reducing the amount of normal tissues receive, uh, receiving radiation dose. Furthermore, we will not always be able to randomize uh, patients in, in, in randomized trials, for instance, for rare tumors, and sometimes when it's unethical, so in young children, for instance, where the expected benefits of proton therapy are so great, you will never have the equipoise to randomize a trial. And then finally, one might say, is all this argument for randomized trials because of cost and availability? If you look at the computer screen, seeing how much lower dose that the proton therapy delivers to normal tissue, would you not choose proton therapy? So how do we select patients in the absence of randomized trials? In Singapore, we will likely be deferring to the Ministry of Health guidelines. And in other countries, they have other systems, uh, such as the Dutch using comparative plans between uh, X-rays and protons. But as a rule of thumb, uh, if you just follow that this tumour uh, is large or deep, or in a young patient, or needs very high dose, uh, next to sensitive organs, then quite likely proton therapy would be beneficial in such a case. The procedure of doing proton therapy is quite similar between uh, that and x-rays. Uh, we will start with simulation, uh, where a CT scan is done in the treatment position, but there are certain pointers that we have to take uh, more note of in proton therapy. And when it comes to computer planning, there are also certain principles uh, that we will have to follow or pay more attention to in proton therapy. When it comes to treatment, patient will be lying on the couch and the proton machine will make a round uh, around the patient to acquire CT scan and X-ray for accurate positioning, followed by the treatment. And this may typically take between 10 minutes to half an hour. There are some caveats to proton therapy. So, one is that proton therapy does not reduce the dose to normal organs that are within the target. So for instance, if this tumour is surrounding a carotid artery in the case of re-irradiation, uh, we would not be able to expect that proton is able to spare the carotid artery from high dose. Yeah. And uh, there are some disadvantages to proton therapy. One is that the uh, proton high dose may take a few more millimetres to fall off to a low dose compared to X-rays. So the low doses are certainly in benefit of proton therapy, but the high dose X-rays may have some advantage. And then, although it's 
uh, clear that the proton therapy has uh, lesser intermediate and low dose splash, uh, we still have to prove uh, with clinical trials that these low doses uh, will translate to a benefit, for instance, uh, in lower future second malignancy risk. Uh, so one of the difficulties with proton therapy compared to X-rays is that we not only have to point the radiation in the correct direction, but we have to correct, uh, shoot it at the correct speed or else it will overshoot or undershoot. Uh, in addition, there are also biological differences in the effect of protons versus X-rays. And we have to take mitigating measures uh, to make sure that the dose that we intend uh, ends up in the correct organ. So in conclusion, the big advantage for proton therapy is that it stops and hence reduces radiation dose to surrounding tissues. In most cases, X-ray therapy will still be the mainstay and thus a good job. So who is proton therapy for? It will be most beneficial for large tumours, uh, tumours that are uh, located in deep organs, uh, for young patients who are still growing or have a long lifetime ahead who may then be exposed to second malignancy risk, uh, tumours uh, that are located in sensitive organs like the liver, or when you need high doses uh, in a tumour near a normal organ. We don't have much level 1 evidence, but they are coming. Protons uh, have certain uh, physical characteristics that make them sensitive to uh, changes, uh, and hence we have to take mitigating measures to make sure they end in the right spot. And there have been many uh, technological advances in proton therapy that have come in the last few years and will be coming soon. In uh, Parkway, uh, we will be having an IBA Proteus 1 proton machine, which is one of the single room uh, modern uh, proton machines. All our doctors, physicists and therapists have undergone overseas training uh, in proton therapy. Uh, patients will first be presented at the proton tumour board for uh, confirmation of their suitability for proton therapy. And we will be following uh, ministry guidelines, uh, some of which are shown on the list here. And uh, last of all, uh, there may be a question of cost. Uh, cost will be controlled and uh, not too much uh, higher than normal radiotherapy. So thank you very much. <laughs>